Okay, welcome uh, to this lecture on aspects of western philosophy module 25. So, in continuation with uh, the topics which we have covered in the last lecture, this lecture will again concentrate on the works of Hegel, particularly the two topics which we are going to address, which we are going to discuss in this lecture are the concept of absolute idealism and then uh, the major theme of the phenomenology of spirit, which is the, the progress from consciousness to self consciousness and from there ultimately to reason. So, the three stages of evolution of spirit. So, these are the topics which we are going to primarily cover in this lecture. As I have already mentioned in the previous lecture, Hegelian philosophy or Hegel as a philosopher is a very interesting thinker because uh, particularly for Indians, because is very close to India's Vedantic tradition with this concept of absolute or geist or universal mind, which encompasses the hall of reality. And in that sense Hegel is very important thinker, Hegel is, a, Hegel is a very special thinker for Indians number one. And another thing is that Hegel follows a period which is immediately after enlightenment or rather at the peak of enlightenment, particularly after Immanuel Kant introduced his very important and influential philosophy, critical philosophy or transcendental critical philosophy in German philosophical circles. And Hegel is trying to respond to some of the concerns which Kant himself has raised or Kant himself has responded to, at the same time trying to improve upon Kant, trying to resolve certain issues which Kantian transcendental philosophy or enlightenment philosophy as such could not rather resolve. So, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, Hegel is adopting a kind of totalizing approach to philosophy and he has a concept which encompasses all reality under one umbrella concept that is absolute. So, we will start with that concept absolute idealism and here this is as it is evident from an introduction to Hegel, uh, Hegel's primary aim is to arrive at an all encompassing theory to bridge the finite with the infinite. Again we can see this as a response to enlightenment philosophy. In enlightenment uh, this is very clear for example, Kant has maintained a distinction between finite and the infinite, the phenomena and the nomina. The phenomenal reality is finite that which is experienced, that which appears in front of us and something which does not appear, something which lies behind it, something which is infinite. So, this division is fundamental to enlightenment thought and also to Kantian philosophy, but Hegelian system is trying to address this issue and trying to resolve this or trying to bridge this gap between uh, finite and the infinite. It is only the hall is real, this is again a very celebrated Hegelian slogan, only the hall is real. All particular facts and concepts are incomplete and only are partially true. Each concept taken in isolation, each concept taken in abstraction is incomplete and untrue, the hall alone is true, that is the fundamental Hegelian absolute. And what is this hall? This hall is the absolute, the spirit, the mind. So, and again Hegel's new way of thinking, we can take the irrational approach to of contradicting ourselves, which we have already examined in the previous lecture, the method of dialectics. So, to understand or to comprehend reality, which is rational in essence, human reason can do that. Hegel has the faith in human reason, he, is, he has the confidence in human reason that human mind can apprehend, can comprehend reality, because reality essentially shares a rational structure with the human mind, because the human mind is also part of it. Now, how does the human mind approach reality? There should be a method and this method is the method of dialectics, where we allow a we sort of we take an irrational approach contradicting ourselves apparently irrational approach. That is because you are dealing with the absolute, which encompasses everything all different entities are under that absolute. So, once you try to understand those reality a phenomena which includes everything, it is bound to include also differences, different entities, entities which are different from each other and even sometimes contradict each other, concepts which contradict each other. So, naturally we have to adopt 
an irrational approach and cosmic history consists in the life history of spirit or geist which is the absolute and the geist is a process a rational process. We have already examined this in the previous lecture a little bit when we talked about reality conceiving reality as a process not as a static entity as Immanuel Kant conceived it. It is a process, it is a process which involves the interaction between the subject and the object. So, the fundamental uh, distinction between subject and object is blurred in Hegelian philosophy, because it is a process where this interaction of subject and object is also part of it. Again the absolute encompasses everything, everything. So, all different entities contradicting aspects, concepts everything is part of that everything I just quote everything that from eternity has happened in heaven and earth the life of God and all the deeds of time are simply the struggles of spirit to know itself and to find itself. So, Hegel presents conception of reality as an absolute as an as an absolute entity which is not an entity as such because in order to be an entity something needs to limit itself, but absolute is an unlimited indefinite. Uh, substance entity, but of course different from the concept of infinite substance advocated by Spinoza and many others. Here the substance involves differences, the differences and contradictions are real they are not unreal in Hegel and it is a process, it is a process, it is a moving dynamic process according to him and, uh, and again what is this process, this process as a meaning in every stage the process characterized by a moment of realization and in each stage it realizes the higher stages from lower to higher. So, there is a teleology that is being unraveled in the process and towards the end it culminates in the absolute. So, it is a process where spirit the absolute realizes itself knows itself and to find itself. Again spirit is universal and concrete within itself it is intelligent comprehension of itself, it is intelligent comprehension of itself. So, every unraveling of the spirit or evolution stage of evolution is nothing but a, an intelligent comprehension of itself is at the same time the progression of the total evolving reality. And here uh, we can see in this figure a summary of uh, Hegelian project, Hegelian philosophy. Hegel divides philosophy into three, three basic headings. Logic which deals with the account of the forms of thought, where he also includes dialectic and other aspects of it, which we have already discussed. The second one is nature philosophy, where uh, it deals with the natural sciences as the manifestation of the forms of thought. All natural sciences are nothing but as the manifestation of this universal thinking. And again the philosophy of the Geist deals with the manifestation of the forms of thought in society. So, it is a historical process. So, in one sense Hegel wants to comprehend everything comprehensively bring everything put everything together under this notion of philosophy which philosophers can know. Logic the account of the forms of thought natural philosophy deals with the natural sciences as the manifestations of the forms of thought and philosophy of guys deals with the manifestation of the forms of thought in society. What is important here is all the three sections deal with forms of thought and the fundamental unity of the rational forms are emphasized by Hegel. So, everything is rational. So, I mentioned in the previous lecture that Hegel and on one occasion he says that he proclaims one of the very important insights of Hegelian philosophy the rational is real and the real is rational the rational forms are the real forms. Rationally understanding the world consists in understanding the world deeply into the deeper levels of reality. You actually delve into the deeper levels of reality through this to, through by applying the rational approach. Everything coincides in the absolute and the absolute is the ultimately real which is the whole process that encompasses the subjective and the objective it is the same rational structures are in me the my thinking my rational thinking my thoughts follow the same rational structure which is manifested in reality in the world in nature in human history in all that man engaged in doing like architecture arts
philosophy, religion, everywhere the same reality is manifested. So, the ultimately real which is the whole process encompasses the subjective, the objective, internal and external and all the three dimensions of time. It is a complex organic system. So, Hegel emphasizes the word organic because the kind of unity he was trying to envisage is a kind of organic unity constituted of individual separate things that are real, their reality consisting in them being an aspect of the whole. So, each object is real unlike Spinoza, in Spinoza's substance we have seen that you know the, the, the final analysis substance alone is real, everything sort of becomes unimportant, but here the separate things are real their reality consisting in them being an aspect of the whole. So, there is a kind of interconnectedness without the whole the a finite independent entities never exist, but without these finite independent entities the infinite also never exists. There is an interconnectedness, there is a logical interconnectedness between this. What makes the infinite, infinite is the finite, it is in relation with the finite the infinite becomes infinite and vice versa, incorporates both the finite and the infinite, bridges the finite with the infinite. So, that is one of the primary purposes of Hegelian system. Now, again absolute idealism does not talk about the reality that appears before us something which Kant would talk about the phenomenal reality which appears before us which is not thing in itself, which is not things in themselves, which is not the nominal ultimately real. The all encompassing theory of absolute idealism cannot be approached with the model of cognition advocated by enlightenment rationality, enlightenment rationality functions on the basis of certain fundamental dichotomies between finite and infinite, between appearance and reality something which we can never see and all such you know internal and external mind and the world. So, all such sort of dichotomies are fundamental for uh, enlightenment rationality which Hegel cannot accept. Hegelian approach is to, to, to totalize everything, to bring everything together comprehensive approach he adopts. Turn inward to our understanding to arrive at the true source of philosophical knowledge. So, it is it is a kind of in that sense you know it is very close to the Kantian approach, Kant also does this he also turns inward trying to understand what is there, I mean the gaze is on the consciousness in the Kantian philosophy as well, but Hegel refers to or rather he goes a little further than Immanuel Kant and uh, our understanding to arrive at the true sources of philosophical knowledge, what is that, what is that rational structures which constitute everything that is what his aim is, allow contradiction to take place and reconcile them this we have already examined and allow the process of progress and manifest itself in thinking and reality. Now, the concept of reality is uh, it is a very interesting notion he has which is again drastically different from the enlightenment conception, because the enlightenment conception never adopts a teleological approach. So, but for Hegel the notion of reality he advocates is governed by the principle of teleological causality and not mechanical efficient causality of the enlightenment tradition, cause effect relationship as it is explained in the uh, enlightenment tradition, but here the emphasis is more on the interconnectedness, it is on the hall. The meaning of each stage is realized in the hall which is the rational, which is the absolute. So, there is always a notion of absolute which is not something yet to be arrived at, but it is a process the abs absolute is not actually independent of this independent entities which are in a process of realizing or actualizing their potentialities, but everything put together is what constitutes the absolute. So, here we can see the uh, influence of Aristotle a revision of the conception of rationality and to overcome Kantian separation between nomina and phenomena, finite and infinite, internal and external, appearance and reality all those things which I have already mentioned. So, Hegelian notion of reality is a comprehensive concept which, which is envisaged to overcome all these fundamental dichotomies which Kantian philosophy has presupposed. Again teleological causality the identification of the reality 
as essentially spiritual not material reality is essentially spiritual and when you say reality is essentially spiritual not material everything every change every movement that takes place in nature can be conceived not merely mechanically but containing a meaning so everything that happens has a meaning because nothing is mechanical nothing is purely mechanical things are spiritual so the spiritual aspect is emphasized like aristotle so it's a teleological conception uh, where aristotle originally identified identification of the fully substantial being with spirit with in its essence is activity potentiality to actuality which aristotle has explained which we have already discussed as part of this lecture series in one of the early lectures things have a meaning so this is again another seminal feature of uh, teleological conception everything has a meaning it's not mechanically present there every process happen in the world are rational purposive and uh, with full of meaning so every stage contains the past and also the future in it so every stage is a meaningful process or a meaningful stage in a process that begins from somewhere and is going to culminate in somewhere else and again since reality is rational we can understand it unity of logic and metaphysics understanding trying to understand reality by employing a method is a rational method that's where logic comes into picture and uh, the conception of reality is uh, where your metaphysics comes into picture so metaphysics and logic coincides in uh, hegelian philosophy now again a little bit more about the teleological process i think i should explain this reality world thought and reason are not static like as it was in the case of enlightenment many of these enlightenment philosophers it's static but here it's not static but are dynamic and they move and evolve it's not just blind movement but it's a meaningful evolution that happens so that's why the approach is teleological its evolution and hence is teleological evolutionary process is something that is undeveloped undifferentiated homogeneous and hence abstract develops differentiates splits up assumes many different forms so this is what happens when we deal with reality reality as absolute reality as spirit as geist is a dynamic reality which is a process which is not a static entity but a process which is process in which the undeveloped undifferentiated homogeneous and abstract reality develops into by means of differentiating itself splitting up and assuming many different forms and these different finite forms may contradict each other until at last they are unified in the absolute so in one sense the absolute is not something which is yet to be achieved it's already there but on the other hand each moment is uh, a process of self realization is a continuous process the absolute realizes itself we can put it in that way and absolute is thus a unity in diversity so again we will just invoke this slogan uh, real is rational and rational is real which we have already mentioned in the previous lecture the absolute spirit or god is the ultimate reality the geist or objective mind reality is a complex totality of rational concepts consisting absolute spirit the real is the rational and the rational is real the totality of thought is absolute and infinite unlike the finite minds of humans so here what hegel means by rational is that every aspect of reality or every event of reality has a structure and this structure according to him is a rational structure it exhibits the rational structure that's what he means by reality is rational and rational is real now reality is rational conceptual totality and an integrated and total structure of conceptual truths so everything both the subject and the object everything is a moving dynamic reality it's a conceptual totality it constitutes a conceptual totality and an integrated and total structure of conceptual truths 
the totality of conceptual truth reveals itself in all areas of human experience and knowledge whether it is history or physics or any discipline any intellectual or other endeavor human beings are engaged in it is this totality of conceptual truth reveals itself. And again reality is rational the vast structure of rational concepts that includes all areas. The real is rational, but not different from what is existence. See again it is a very interesting contrast between uh, the enlightenment philosophy particularly Kantian philosophy and Hegelian thought. In Kantian philosophy the real is different from what is existent, what is being perceived, what is being experienced and seen in front of us or rather to put it in other words what is appearing in front of us. But here real is rational, but it is not different from what is existent, rational is the existent object more deeply understood. So, Hegel refers to that depth understanding, the deep understanding of, of all that is existent the deeper understanding of the vast realms of physical and organic nature and of society is what this absolute reality is constitutive of. And again rational concepts are not independent or transcendental apart from the concrete world. So, they are not unlike Kantian forms which are transcendental, they are not independent of it. Rational concepts constitutes that rational core of the world of things. So, they are everything that is why Hegel approaches philosophy with a historian's approach. So, everything every human reality you would find the presence of these rational structures. Reality is knowable its rational structures are knowable this is where you know he is again significantly different from Kantian approach where reality is not knowable Kant is an agnostic he says that the real things in themselves are unknowable one cannot know it, but for uh, an absolute idealist of the Hegelian kind reality is knowable because its rational structures are knowable. It is the same rational structures which our human thinking or human thought shares. So, since there is a commonality between these two one is only a manifestation of the other it is knowable. The absolute reality manifests itself to us in ordinary experience in logic and natural science in psychology politics and history in painting poetry and architecture and in religion and in philosophy in short in all possible human endeavors. The absolute being is the common root of the categories or pure concepts again it is the emptiest and at the same time the most comprehensive reality. So, when we talk about the absolute this is a very interesting aspect that comes to our mind that uh, we can never miss noticing because on the one hand uh, Hegel says it is a root of the categories of pure concept everything it encompasses everything. And uh, in that sense it is not something very specific we can identify what is this absolute we cannot say that it is x or y we cannot specify it we cannot determine it because it is indeterminate it involves everything something which is everything cannot be something, something which is everything cannot be anything because to be anything something has to be something which means we need to determine it, it cannot be indeterminate, but here absolute is essentially indeterminate. And in that sense it is emptiest and at the same time the most comprehensive reality, the most comprehensive is bound to be empty because in order to be something it has to be determinate. The most abstract and the most real at the same time, the most elementary and the most exalted notion all our concepts express modes of being and our transformation of the idea of being. So, the absolute being is not something specific or determinate, because all our concepts are nothing but expressions of modes of this absolute being. Now, every stage in the process contains all the preceding stages and foreshadows all the future stages. So, this is what I said there is a continuity a meaningful continuity where potentialities are actualized. So, every stage in the process 
contains all the preceding stages and foreshadows the future stages. Every finite stage is both a product and a prophecy. The law of form is negated in the higher, but is also preserved in the higher. We have already discussed this when we have discussed the dialectical method in the previous lecture, where how in the process of dialectic or in dialectic method, the uh, thesis and antithesis culminates in the synthesis with a process that involves negation, preservation and elevation, the three important stages in the dialectical method. So, I am not going to the details here. So, it is the same thing the law of form is negated in the higher, but is also preserved in the higher or rather even elevated in the higher. It has been carried over and sublated in the higher. So, in the process of evolution ends or purposes are realized, this is the case with all teleological processes. There is something a purpose, a meaning is realized, a purpose is realized in that process. The purpose of universal reason is realized in the process, the truth lies in the hall, the truth of the organism. And here we can see that you know the fa uh, false and abstract divisions of reality which philosophers often uh, subscribe to. This is the false abstract divisions like between essence and appearance, which is uh, very classically done by the enlightenment philosophers, inner and outer realities, substance and attribute, infinite and finite, force and its expressions, mind and matter, God and the world. So, all these are classical examples where uh, philosophers have maintained divisions in philosophy. According to Hegel, the concept of reality includes all these things. So, this divisions are not really true, the false and abstract divisions philosophers make. Reality is the whole, once you graduate to this conception of reality into an all encompassing, all comprehending reality, then these divisions apparently do not figure in as philosophically significant in your scheme of things. The absolute in that sense is a spiritual and logical process of evolution, it is to comprehend reality we need to experience this process in ourselves. So, something which is again against the, the enlightenment conception which uh, envisages that all understanding consists in the kind of subject object relationship, where the subject is posited over and against the object looks at it dispassionately. So, this notion of subject object epistemological distinction is again cancelled in Hegel, where to comprehend reality we need to experience the process the spiritual and logical process of evolution which is nothing but reality. We need to experience it in us our minds need to experience it in us and we can do that because we also share our thoughts share the rational structures which is nothing but the structure of reality. By reproducing the rational necessity in all thought and in reality in our thinking by dialectic. So, something which you have already explored in the previous lecture, the process of dialogue actually does it by inventing or by encountering the contradictions. Thinking evolves rationally, moves logically, genetically and dialectically. So, thinking is not a static process not a mechanical process which starts from one end and reaches the other end, but it is a kind of interactive process. It moves logically and rationally, but at the same time genetically and dialectically. So, in that way it is interactive, it is historical, it is a process and again the absolute of uh, Geist is the creative logos or reason, it contains in it the entire logical dialectical process which unfolds itself in the world. All the laws of its evolution are outlined in the absolute and hence find expression in the form of objective existence. So, the laws of its evolution, the process of evolution, the process of the evolution of the absolute which is nothing but the world is, everything that happens in this world, everything that goes on in this world is nothing but a part of this process of the evolution of the world which is nothing but an evolution of the absolute or the process that is absolute. So, the evolution is outlined in the absolute and hence find expression in the form of objective existence. So, whatever exist things or uh, processes or events are nothing but manifestations of this process which is absolute. 
and in this context very interesting to see what is God. God is not separate from the world, God is the living and moving reason of the world, God reveals himself in the world in nature and in history. Nature and history are necessary stages in the evolution of God into self consciousness and again God and world are not eternally separated as conceived by enlightenment reason. So, uh, the concept of absolute even encompass this concept. So, in one sense we can say that this absolute is God. So, in that sense God and the world are not really separate from each other. So, the world is also part of that process which absolute is, but God is not absorbed in the world nor the world is absorbed in God. God cannot be without creating a world and without knowing himself in his other the dialectic and absolute is unity of opposition. So, before we conclude our uh, lecture on this, this is an interesting aspect which would actually take us to the next topic the phenomenology of the mind or the phenomenology of the spirit, the relationship between world, God and the human mind. So, again as uh, Hegelian totalizing philosophy emphasizes they cannot be different from each other at the same time they are different. So, it is unity in difference in one sense, because the absolute involves everything, but at the same time different things maintain their differences your, their unique identities. These unique identities these differences these dichotomies and these contradictions are not final, they can be resolved and move on. Only by resolving these differences and dichotomies the process can move on to higher stages. Moving to higher stages is extremely important for Hegelian philosophy, because ultimately the unity needs to be attained. So, human mind is not a mere inferior dependent entity as it is conceived in many other philosophical traditions. Here the interesting aspect is that the divine idea is uh, enriched by its self expression in nature and history and rises through them to self consciousness and the absolute thinks itself in its object. It comes to know its own essence only in evolution and this happens only in man. So, this is the interesting aspect of the interrelationship between God, world and human mind. The divine idea is uh, enriched by its self expressions in nature and history and rises through them to self consciousness. So, it is a process that goes on and on to higher and higher levels of uh, self consciousness. The absolute the process is where the absolute thinking itself in its objects. So, the absolute itself is in the process of thinking by being part of the process or by being the process itself it comes to know its own essence only in evolution and this happens only in man. Now, this expression of universal reason the rational structures or rational forms which Hegel was emphasizing it is visible in nature, individuals, human institutions, history, law, morality, custom, ethical observation everything all over all aspects of human life customs, conventions, beliefs, religious traditions everywhere you will find the expression of the universal reason. In all such instance the universal spirit realizes its purpose in a rational dialectical movement. And the supreme stage is the evolution of the logical idea is the absolute mind. From conceiving it as the culmination of the process is the absolute mind, but the absolute mind involves everything. Now, with this understanding in the backdrop, now we will try to understand this very important aspect of Hegelian philosophy the phenomenology of spirit, which is actually an attempt to outline biography of the spirit of humanity. As Hegel already mentioned are all human endeavors or all human achievements, human history itself is nothing but a process. Since the process is teleological it can be also understood as a kind of evolution from lower stages to higher and higher stages and finally, to the highest stage which is the ultimate synthesis of everything. So, the phenomenology of spirit is an attempt to present the biography of the spirit of humanity, the evolution of human spirit from lesser stages of existence and realization to higher and ultimately to the highest stage. The phenomenology is important as only in the mind of man one comes to know its own evolution, the absolute comes to know or even God comes to know its own evolution 
and to describe a history of consciousness. So, what is phenomenology? See when we try to understand our mind, our mind alone when we uh, conduct an examination of a study of mind, we call it psychology, but uh, mind is an entity which uh, comes into contact with objects in the world or the entire world mind is in contact with. So, when you try to understand the mind in connection with the objects to which it is related, then uh, it is not purely psychology, then it is you are trying to approach it from a different perspective. When we try to understand our own understanding of the world, that is where we become conscious about ourselves. So, consciousness is being studied. So, what happens here is that phenomenology studies mind in relation to external or internal objects what happens when the mind comes into contact with external as well as internal objects. There is a consciousness about these objects, so that consciousness is being studied. So, in one sense we can say that phenomenology is a science of consciousness, phenomenology is actually not Hegel's invention, but Hegel significantly contributes to the development of phenomenology, which by a 19th century leaps into new domains and nowadays in today current contemporary philosophy phenomenology is a very significant philosophical approach, but the Hegelian sense it consists of three main parts corresponding with the three main phases of consciousness. The three main phases of consciousness are one is consciousness where you are just conscious of something see I am conscious of this chair in front of me or a camera in front of me or various other things in front of me just a kind of uh, you know uh, consciousness about something which is there present. The second stage it is called self consciousness, I am conscious of the fact that I am conscious okay. and uh, the third stage is reason, I will explain that in due course. The first one is consciousness where uh, as I said it is a stage of sense certainty, something is there, the chair is there in front of me, the camera is there in front of me or the world of things are there in front of me. So, there is a kind of sense certainty present at this stage it is an uncritical apprehension by the senses of particular objects, I am not reflecting upon what it is, what the process is going on. Say when I see the camera in front of me or a chair in front of me, I am not really reflecting what is happening that process, I am just understanding that it is a camera or a chair. So, it is a kind of uncritical apprehension by the senses of a particular object and appears to the naive consciousness as the most certain and basic form of knowledge. I never doubt it, there is a chair in front of me, there is a camera in front of me, I never doubt that, that is something which is so certain as far as I am concerned, but now the moment I try to describe it, when I try to describe such an object, see there is a camera in front of me or there are 20 chairs in front of me there is one human being standing in front of me. So, when I the moment I try to describe these experiences which have these sense certainties which have in order to describe such an object of immediate acquaintance we need to employ universal category. So, when I say 20 chairs in front of me, so I am employing the universal category of quantity 20, 20 is a universal uh, it is nothing very peculiar to these chairs here, it is a universal I can even say 20 human beings or 20 days, 20 hours. So, all these are I mean I am employing a universal category of quantity which is very Kantian in that sense. So, what Hegel reminds us is that this level of static sense certainty will not take us further. The moment we try to describe our sense certainty our experiences we have to actually refer back to universal categories and uh, these universal categories have to be found within ourselves, they are not there, the chairs are there, but the 20 chairs to understand it as a chair, as a blue chair with a certain features, I mean to understand an object as a chair is to understand it as a certain object with certain features, which means my mind is able to categorize it as something, to categorize it as something this knowledge should come from within from my mind. So, it is my contribution, so what Hegel says is that often we invoke meta phenomenal or unobservable entities to explain sense phenomena, say for example, nowadays we talk about nanotechnology, so we refer to nanoparticles of objects. So, an understanding of a particular object 
or understanding of a particular process is possible by invoking this notion of nanoparticles. So, when I do that what I am trying to do is that uh, this category of you know particles category of nano particles they are all something which is there my contribution the contribution of my consciousness the source of such categories are my own understanding they are not in the world, but they are in my own understanding consciousness is thus turned back to itself. So, in this way I am actually forced to turn back to myself. So, which is a Kantian process it becomes self conscious or self consciousness we can say and now the summary of this uh, discussion is sense certainty can say that an object is, but not what it is. There is an object, but what it is, it is a chair, it is an apple, it is a camera. So, all such categorizations are done by me, they are my contribution. Now, we come to self consciousness, the self is concerned with the external objects, the self subordinates the object to itself and uh, approach the object to comprehend it and use it to its purposes. See, when I see a chair, I subordinate the object to myself, I, it is a chair it is something which I can use for serving my own purposes. I would rather use the word I objectify it everything in front of me I objectify it, I have a use with it, I can appropriate it, tries to appropriate it and consume it. Okay. So, I am using it for my own purposes, it is an object for me, I distinguish myself from that object that object is only an object while I am a subject, I am a self. Now, as far as chairs and tables and cameras are concerned this is all right, this approach is fundamentally all right, there is absolutely no problem in it. But the moment I encounter another human being encounters a threat when the self confronts other selves which are different from objects, instead of a chair I have a human being in front of me. That moment there is a threat, I cannot objectify that human being, because that human being is not just like a chair, but he or she is like me, like a subject and he or she can also objectify me. So, if I want to assert my own selfhood, my own distinguished identity as a self, as a subject and not just a mere object, then I will have to make him or her an object. So, my attempt to objectify him. I will definitely attempt to objectify him, but the problem is that if I try to objectify him then the possibility that he would also try to objectify me is actually posing a threat to my own existence. So, the recognition and the realization that the world is constitutive of subjects like me and not just objects like chairs and tables that poses a threat to my own existence. So, that is where the second stage encounters a kind of uh, what you call dilemma or a kind of crisis in its existence. Encountering the other self, the self feels a desire to cancel out or annihilate the other self as a means to the uh, assert its own selfhood. So, in order to assert my selfhood I am trying to cancel that other self, so but this is counterproductive the consciousness of one's own selfhood demands as a condition the recognition of this selfhood by another self. So, for me to exist as a self, so that I can assert my selfhood, I need the other person who would recognize me as a self. So, all my attempts to cancel his or her selfhood, assuming that his or her selfhood is a potential threat to my own selfhood is bound to be counterproductive, because if I annihilate him, if I make him non self then who is there to recognize me as a self. So, it is going to be counterproductive, the master slave relationship is invoked here in this context famously by Hegel, it says that in order to assert one's own selfhood one enslaves the other. So, one possibility is that I encounter along with chairs and tables and other objects in the world a human being who is also a self like me. Now, that poses a threat to me and I want to assert my selfhood. So, in order to assert my selfhood what I will do is that I will enslave the other person, enslaving by enslaving the other person I am just taking away or annihilating his selfhood, I am not recognizing him as a human being.
Now, by enslaving the other, one does not recognize the former as a real person. So, for me, I, he or she ceases to uh, be a person, and by doing this, the master deprives himself of the recognition of his own freedom, which he originally demanded. This freedom is essential for the development of self consciousness. What happens is that here the master becomes dependent on the slave for asserting his selfhood, that is quite paradoxical. On the one hand, you need others to recognize you as a self, so that your assertion of selfhood is meaningful. On the other hand, again, your master becomes dependent on the slave for asserting his selfhood. The paradox of enslaving the other is in order to assert one's freedom, one enslaves another person and then becomes dependent on that slave. So, you ultimately become the slave of your slave. Then a slave on the other hand frees himself through labor which transforms material things. So, he does things in nature, he makes it transforms nature for the sake of his master he starts doing it, but through his labor he liberates himself. So, every master slave relationship is bound to be counterproductive. Now, in this context Hegel talks about the other stage, the ultimate stage where reason, the finite subject rises to universal self consciousness, realization that we are all manifestation of the universal spirit. So, here instead of being in a world where you exist as a subject without any critical awareness of your status just having self certainty, you have progressed to the next stage or you have evolved to the next stage of self consciousness, where you realize that there are other selves who actually posit a threat to your own selfhood and that insecurity of being among other selfhoods who are different from you, who are positing a threat to your own selfhood and your constant you know struggle to enslave them, which is ultimately proving to be counterproductive you reach a third stage or you rather rise to a third stage, you evolve to a third stage of reason, where you realize that you as well as others are all manifestations of the universal self, universal mind, universal spirit. So, it is not the one sided awareness of oneself as an individual subject threatened by and in conflict with other self conscious beings, it is a full recognition of selfhood in oneself and in others. So, we all realize we are all manifestations of that universal mind, once that realization arrives the confrontation becomes what meaningless, then there is no confrontation. So, reason takes us to that domain, a synthesis of the first two stages of consciousness and self consciousness. Uh, consciousness is where subject is aware of the sensible object as something external and heterogeneous to itself, self consciousness is subjects attention is turned back on itself as a finite self and reason is where it sees everything as the objective expression of infinite spirit with which it is itself united. We will conclude our discussion on Hegelian philosophy at this point, where Hegel as we have seen there are three things very important about Hegel. One is that his conception of reality, he never conceives reality as independent of the subject or the knower of reality. So, there is no epistemological strict epistemological split between subject and object, which is so cardinal for enlightenment philosophy. Number two, same rational forms that constitute reality are constitutive of the human thought as well. So, in one sense the human thought can understand can comprehend reality, because they share the same universal rational forms. And the third important point is reality is the absolute which encompasses everything. And Hegel talks about a method by means of which this reality can be comprehended, the dialectical method, where you have to contradict yourself, allow contradictions to happen and then resolve them and ultimately synthesize them. That is the method he, he suggests and he explains the process, for him it is a historical process, it is an evolution in which the from the level of consciousness of bare awareness, bare static certainty sense certainty, you reach the second stage of self consciousness, where you encounter and confront other selves to the third stage, where you realize and experience that unity in you and everything is part of that universal ultimate absolute.
reality. So, this is uh, in summary the Hegelian philosophy and the Hegelian system and Hegel is a very important thinker we will examine the influence of Hegel in the next lecture as well where we will be discussing the contributions of Karl Marx the division between left Hegelians and others. So, Marx and others develop a philosophy a materialistic philosophy out of Hegelian idealism which is a objective idealism of Hegel and then again even in contemporary philosophy we can see the tremendous influence of Hegelian philosophy. So, we will conclude our discussion on uh, the contributions of this most important thinker of uh, modern period. Thank you.